repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And at this time, we'll call the hearing to order. I'll ask the, uh, the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, legislator. Minority Affairs Committee roll call. Deborah Muley, Kevin Abrahams. Here. Thank you. Uh, ranking member Carrie Salage. Here. Legislator Denise Ford. Legislator James Kennedy. Here. Vice Chairwoman Rosemary Walker. Here. Chairman Steve Rhodes. Present. We have a quorum, sir. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I do want to welcome uh, Lionel Chitty, uh, who is the ex Executive Director of the Office of Minority Affairs, uh, Bishop Lionel Harvey, uh, who is the Deputy Director, as well as Dr. Regina Williams, uh, also the, a Deputy Director. Uh, thank you so much for being here, and I appreciate your time. And again, I apologize for the delay in getting started this morning. Um, I am aware that you have a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation to, uh, to make. Uh, just to give some brief remarks regarding the, uh, the purpose of, of today's hearing, obviously last year, uh, prior to your appointment, uh, Mr. Chitty, um, we did conduct a, a hearing uh, of uh, uh, minority affairs to try and get into uh, some, of the, some information about the Office of Minority Affairs, uh, what the vision for the office was. Um, it was clear from, uh, from those hearings, uh, even though we did receive some information, uh, it was clear that the, the lack of an executive director, a permanent executive director, uh, really did impact the uh, the operations of the office and um, the your executive director position you know at that point we we're a year and a half into the administration uh, your executive director position and your appointment uh, a little less than a year ago uh, was the last appointment of of any major office uh, within the county um, and, and I really feel as though that that hindered uh, to a certain extent, um, the the operations of the office. But now that you're there, and now that you've been there for a while, we had wanted to have these hearings earlier, but then we were hit with COVID. Uh, so uh, first off, um, I want to welcome everyone back. This is actually the first public hearing that the county legislature is having uh, since the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is the first hearing that's actually open to the public, uh, at least in some limited way, uh, since the since the COVID pandemic. Uh, and in light of everything that's been going on, um, it really underscores uh, from a business standpoint and from a personal standpoint, um, it really underscores the importance of the Office of Minority Affairs. Uh, the purpose of, of today's hearing, uh, sort of like the last one, is to get your vision uh, for the operations of the office. Now that you've been there for a while, you've had a, a, an opportunity to evaluate your staff, evaluate the department's needs. Um, your office is vitally important in that it breathes, li it, it breathes life into the promises that Nassau G County government has made uh, to make county government more inclusive, uh, to make county government um, more accessible uh, to every minority community. And um, you know, I want to make sure, and this committee wants to make sure, that you have all the resources that you need to be able to get that done. And now that you've had the opportunity to be in that office for a while, uh, we wanted to hear about your vision, your goals, uh, what you think the strengths and weaknesses are uh, within that office, um, how your office is, is interacting with other uh, divisions within county government, um, whether you're getting the information that you need in order to be able to fill your mission uh, under the charter. Uh, and what ways we as a legislature can assist in that process uh, because we want to make sure that, that the Office of Minority Affairs is not just an office that exists um, on paper to make everybody feel good. We want to make sure that the Office of Minority Affairs exists to fulfill the very broad and very important mandate that was set forth in its charter. Uh, and our responsibility is, is to make sure that that takes place and that you have the tools and you have the resources that you need uh, to be able to do that. So, you know, it, that, that to me is, is the most important reason that we're having the hearing today, uh, is to get that perspective and see how we can move forward together uh, to make sure that we're fulfilling the, the promise 
uh, of the Office of Minority Affairs and the promise that we've made uh, to all the constituents of Nassau County to make Nassau County uh, accessible and reachable to everyone. So uh, again, I thank you for being here. I didn't know if, uh, Carrie, did you have a, a statement? Thank you, Chair. Good morning to everyone, and good morning to this highly esteemed panel uh, established here today, Bishop, Director, Doctor. It's my pleasure to have you here. Thank you for calling this hearing, and it is very symbolic and important that this is the first hearing being held in post-COVID times. I would like to welcome everyone to the new legislature. Uh, although it may look like the DMV, it is not the DMV. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the administration and the DPW for installing this for our safety. Uh, and <clears throat> although my colleague here, Legislative Bino, is here this morning, she will not be allowed to speak because she is not on the committee as per the chair, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, yet uh, she has been very helpful on these issues. And furthermore, uh, I would like you to please take advantage of this opportunity here today to provide information to us and, uh, so that we could learn how to help further your department. In addition, I guess your role today is a very quite difficult role because at the same time you're here to talk about the great work that you're doing, it's very difficult also to mention the lack of support that you don't have from the, from the administration, the same administration that is supposed to support you. So we're walking a very fine line here today. Uh, but I would ask you please to be as candid as possible. Uh, I have a copy of the transcript from the last hearing. I'm going to be asking some questions from the transcript. If you'd like to share a copy of this transcript, I would love to pass it over to you. Um, in addition, uh, and I mentioned that because on the transcript from the last hearing, I pointed out that this office has a very important regulatory role with respect to Title VI and affirmative action. These important laws are meant to help to diversify our government and our community, to make sure that our government reflects our community. We're not asking for much here, we're just asking for diversity, right? And so, one important thing in this transcript that I've noticed is that there was a need for an attorney in this office to help accomplish and fulfill some of the regulatory roles. I don't know whether or not we have an attorney in the office or someone in that capacity that could help understand the compliance when it comes to Title VI and affirmative action, but we're gonna hopefully help establish that here today. So I wanna thank all my colleagues for being here today, and let's get started. Thank you, Legislator Slaughters. And Mr. Chitty, I understand you have a presentation. Uh, yes, floor, I do. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, thank you very much. Again, thank you everybody for this opportunity to come before you today, all the legislators especially uh, thanks to my uh, team here, Dr. Uh, Dr. Regina Williams, Bishop Harvey, and my entire staff. Thank you very much for attending. We do have a presentation, and the title of this presentation is Building a New Foundation. OMA 2020 Strategic Plan Primary Objectives. Assist county efforts to ensure access to services, employment and housing opportunities, and address economic disparities. Enhance diversity and inclusion awareness throughout Nassau County. Increase participation of MWBEs, DBEs and SDVOBs in county procurements, other governmental and private sector opportunities. Next, we have our entire staff, myself as Executive Director, Bishop Lionel Harvey, uh, Deputy Director, uh, Dr. Regina Williams, also Deputy Director. We have Lynn Pohl, Special Assistant, Dexter Hedgepeth, Program Coordinator, Michelle Crosley, Program Coordinator, and also Victoria Roberts, Program Supervisor. Objective one enhancing opportunities for minority residents and addressing disparities. During COVID-19, our response, urging community members to stay safe, get tested at county free community sites, assisting residents with securing county services, supporting residents in applying for unemployment insurance benefits, assisting with community food distributions, celebrating the strength of our community through challenging times. COVID-19 response, second portion, minority health equity. On April 17th, myself, uh, Deputy uh, Executive Director um, Amy Flores from the Office of Hispanic Affairs, and also Andrea Albrutus, Director of Health Equity for the Nassau County Department of Health, we uh, recorded a Zoom conference, and that conference was uh, created out of the facts that we realized and it was proven that communities of color were ex hit extremely hard with COVID. This video has about uh, 30, 3,900 views already on Facebook, and we went about uh, 20, 30 minutes just to discuss 
why communities of color were hit, what are the resources available to them, how to be able to pre prepare yourself and protect yourself during COVID, specifically for those communities. Supporting minority businesses. Assisting MWBEs with the Boost NASA loan applications, the Federal Paycheck Protection Program, and the SBA's Emergency Industry Disaster Loan Process. Promoting and assisting county's personal protection equipment kit giveaway. Advertising businesses, advising businesses on New York State closure rules and reopening guidelines. Participating in the County Executive's COVID-19 Economic Advisory Council with the Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce, the Long Island Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and the NASA Council of Chambers of Commerce. Reopening safely, supporting our MWBEs. Our OMA team has been out and about visiting our MWBEs throughout this crisis and reopening of their businesses. We will continue to connect with our constituents in order to assist them in navigating through these challenging times. Our small businesses are the economic engines of our communities. Objective two, increasing diversity and inclusion. To foster inclusion and diversity in collaboration with our other outreach offices, the Office of Hispanic Affairs, Office of Asian American Affairs, and the Human Rights Commission and other agencies. Working collaboratively on known shared interest areas, such as Census 2020, civil service opportunities, mental, minority mental health, and workforce development. Identify and engage key stakeholders, community leaders, faith-based and nonprofit partners. Create and support community, cultural events, and encourage participation amongst diverse groups. Continuation of increasing diversity and inclusion. OMA collaborates with other county departments to priority, pr prioritize language access. Throughout the pandemic, OMA ensured translation of important documents for the Haitian Creole community. Examples of those documents included Know Your Rights, COVID-19 testing locations, coronavirus fact sheet, messages from the Nassau County Department of Health, and community resource booklet. Also, that working with the county, we have residents, we notified residents that they can also receive the county's text updates in multiple languages text COVID-19, COVID Nassau 1 to 888-777, specifically for Haitian Creole. Those will give you updates continuously as they come across. A voice in important conversations. Unified Long Island is a bi-county task force intended to empower communities to stand united against all acts of hate and bias that are based on anti-Semitism, anti race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, gender, gender identity, disability, or sexual orientation. The task force partners with existing stakeholders, leaders, and residents, as well as law enforcement agencies, human rights advocates, community organizations, religious institutions, government offices, and education platforms to adv advocate for unity, acceptance, and diversity. This task force is working to develop and implement an action plan to identify and document hate and bias incidents while working towards strengthening the bonds of friendship and respect within the and amongst the communities across Long Island. OMA's direct deputy director, Bishop Lionel Harvey, is the Nassau County Chair for this endeavor. A voice in important conversations. The police and community trust or PACT. On June 17th, County Executive Curran announced the creation of PACT, a new initiative aimed at building trust, transparency, and a working dialogue between community activists and Nassau County Police. Co-chaired by County Executive Curran and South Floral Park Mayor Jeffrey Prime, PACT membership includes Police Commissioner Ryder, community leaders, activists, and police officers. Ongoing meetings engage additional participation from law enforcement and the community. OMA's Program Supervisor Victoria Roberts is, the, is our liaison for this important effort. Objective three, increasing minority participation in county contracting current administration committed to maximizing participation in MWBE, DBE, and SDVOB vendors in county contracting opportunities. It's good for business, good for the county. Essential, it's an essential, essential element of effective public procurement, ensures greater competition at lower cost and higher service levels, strengthens the local and small business communities, encourages greater entrepreneurship in the county, promotes open, fair, and transparent process for county contracts. Current administration building blocks to increase MWBE participation. County vendor portal, 
elimination of the 125 vendor registration fee for that portal, comprehensive tracking system for MWBE, DBE, and SDVOBs, the new certification app, and next up, our disparity study. OMA's new MWBE certification app. OMA has endeavored to further streamline MWBE participation by combining the registration and certification processes in a new electronic filing system. The new online filing system, launched during COVID and fully functional on June 12, 2020, is tremendous, is a, will tremendously aid OMA in serving MWBEs. It allows for easy upload of documents and speeds up OMA staff review. It includes a step-by-step -step tutorial to assist constituents with registration and county's vendor portal how-to for uploading MWBE documents for certification and a training tutorial for staff instructional purposes. OMA's Deputy Director, Dr. Regina L. Williams, created this concept and oversees the MWBE program, while Program Coordinator Michelle Crosley functions as the certification analyst for MWBEs. OMA thanks Commissioner Stanton and the IT team for a successful collaboration. Continuation of OMA's new county certification app. Fully automated process for county certification. Captures info from the vendor portal. Step-by-step -step tutorials for business owners and OMA staff. Database encompasses all, all pre-2020 files plus all new certification. Conducts surveys, contacts, vendors, and more. Here we have the new certification app. Here's a screenshot that shows the, uh, a screenshot of the application itself. This is our total direct directory that lists all the MWBs. Next, we have a detailed display in bold, and extracted, which was extracted from our vendor portal, which shows that uh, a sample of contact information. Next, we have a tab here that shows all the certifications, all the list, all the businesses that are currently certified with Nassau County. OMA's new uh, MWBE app also allows us to send email notifications. We can send out certification information, community functions, county solicitations, events, forms that are being held, pre-certification notifications, and also registrations. We also have the ability to utilize that system to inform businesses that have already been, on, already been certified with OMA yet never registered with the county to be able to re get them recertification reminders for businesses once they certify, once their certification has expired, community function events, certification forms, including the long form application, the short form application, and recertification application, site visit questionnaire. We can also inform them of county solicitation, pre-bid forums, and also surveys, which is, an import which is important that we conduct surveys to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our MWBEs. Next, you see a sample of an email that is sent to uh, those who have gained certification once it's been approved, congratulating them and welcoming them, welcoming them and also including our contact information moving forward. Next, we have a copy of the certification letter that is emailed to them once they are approved. Next, we have the certification itself. Here's a sample certification automatically emailed once they are approved. Next, we have the Nassau County Office of Minority Affairs MWBE Online Filing Tutorial 2020. We have a QR code here. If you scan that code, it will take you directly to a YouTube video that will walk you through the entire process. Next, we have the numbers. Our MWBE vendor registration numbers. We will start with January, from January 2019 through April 2019. Total number of minority-owned businesses, 197. Women-owned businesses, 262. Minority women-owned businesses, 58. Veteran service disabled veteran-owned businesses, 29. As of July 31st, 2020, we now have minority-owned 770. Women-owned 875. Minority women-owned 267. Veteran service disabled veteran-owned businesses, 96. Our certification process, going back to January 2019 to December 2019, total MWBE certified by the Office of Minority Affairs, 132. As of July 31st, 2020,
total MWBE certified by the Office of Minority Affairs year to date, 77. This is from the app, which was fully functional as of July 12th. What we did was we focused on completing that application and uh, the application to automate, automate the certification process and we moved forward from there. Total MWBE's pending certification, this includes new businesses and recertifications. We had a large influx during COVID. That total number is 990. Next up, the MWBE SDVOB disparity study. The disparity study is a critical component to setting meaningful goals of MWBE participation in county procurement. Funding was authorized by the Nassau County Legislature and included in county's capital budget. RFP number MA1216-1965 for the study was issued December 2019. It includes consultant services as well as study to maximize impact. Nassau Suffolk Selection Committee review of proposals nearing completion. Notice of award expected soon. Stay tuned. OMA's Summer Youth 2020. Participates in, participants in the Nassau County Summer Youth Program have been assisting OMA with the enormous amount of MWBE work by updating records in the MWBE app. They've started the process of scanning out paper files totaling 1,136 as of December 31st, 2019. Our goal is to scan the documents for each MWBE file into our automated system to have everything accessible online. We have 10 summer youth that are participating this year and helping us. Moesha Kasma from Westbury High School, Vicencia Bermudez, Suni Canton, Major Criminal Investigations, Elijah Kelly, Becca Worcester Mass, Major Computer Gaming Design, Cindy Villard, Queensboro Community College, Major Counselor, Rashawn Simon, Lincoln University, Major Liberal Arts, Jonathan Tukurs, Queensboro Community College, Major Computer Science, Monica Fasil, Nassau Community College, Major Nursing, Asante Meeks, SUNY Buffalo, Major Pre-Med and Political Science, Xavier Bermudez, SUNY Canton, Major Criminal Investigations, and he also worked with the, our Human Rights Department, and also Jahi Bryant, Freeport High School, who also worked with our Human Rights Commission. OMA's vision moving forward. To establish and implement processes that are productive, sustainable, and focused on the overall mission of the department. Items designated for improvement include RFP, bid solicitation receipt and distribution, mandated reporting, EFC, which is the Environmental Facilities Corporation, FTA, Federal Transportation Administration, MWBE, SDVOB, and internal external communications create and implement meaningful ongoing workshops and forums to educate potential MWBE SDVOB bidders. Event types include procurement forums, pre-construction and technical assistance in collaboration with the county agencies, New York State Empire State De uh, Development Corp, the Port Authority and other organizations with expertise in needed areas. Continue to increase community connectivity, expand upon relationships and participation while working collaboratively with the Office of Hispanic Affairs, Office of Asian American Affairs, and county departments to increase the base of resources available and awareness for constituents. Next two pages, we have snapshots of events that we're participating in starting from 2019. And again, this is just a snapshot, not everything. Uh, Women's Small Business Award celebration with LIAC, the Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce. We attended the MLK 51st anniversary of assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We co-hosted Port Authority of New York, New Jersey certification forum at Nassau Community College. We attended the diversity and business awards for the Long Island Business News, present citations at the Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce, or may attend pre-bid forums, which are very key for MWBEs. We attended the 24th annual Nassau County Bar Association's mentoring ceremony luncheon hosted the Mental Health Forum at the African American Museum of, Com of Nassau County, attended the N NWB NCBW 100 Long Island annual event, hosted the Juneteenth celebration, the first ever, where there was an official proclamation signed by the county executive, census collaboration event with our other outreach offices, attended the New York SUNY CUCF Diversity at Work annual MWBE SDVOB conference, the 2019 ACCA conference in San Antonio, Texas, 
MWB event at Caribbean Business Connection monthly networking event, the Long Island Railroad expansion track tour, citations for the Vladimir Ukrainian Orthodox Church, citations at Christ First Presbyterian Church in Hempstead, their 375 year anniversary celebration, Community uh, Caribbean Business Connections monthly business networking event, OMA and OHA attends MWBE empowerment event. The end of last year, OMA hosts our Kwanzaa celebration at Roosevelt Field. January 2020, OMA attends Nassau County's annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Ecumenical Service and Scholarship Luncheon. OMA attends Nassau County Police Department's Black History Communi Community Forum. OMA hosts the Millennial Chat at the Yes We Can Center in Westbury. We attended the Black History Celebration Amistad case with your, or with, or in collaboration with Youth Services. We hosted a Black History Celebration with, at the Nassau County Legislature. Also attended uh, the Black History Breakfast at the Village of Hempstead. Attended the Black History Celebration at the Islamic Center of Long Island. Attended the Project Restoration Terrace Avenue Press Conference. Or may host Minority Breakfast with the, in conjunction with the Nassau County IDA and the Long Island African American Chamber of Commerce. And then we also host a faith-based security grant seminar. Then we were in the midst of COVID. During COVID, we hosted the Minority Health Presentation with the Office of Hispanic Affairs and the of, um, Office of uh, Diversity and um, Health Inclusion, Diversity, Office of D Diversity Health with the uh, Department of Health. Office, uh, OMA, we did interviews with the county executive of IRE, on Irie GM Radio. We attended the ABBA Mother's Day celebration. We joined this county executive for our Juneteenth kickoff in Manhasset. We also hosted a virtual Juneteenth celebration via Zoom. Interviews with Tower Talk with NASA Tower Talk Business with NASA Community College, and just as recently attended the uh, Union Dale Community Council via Zoom. And um, again, these were snapshots, not everything. I think we'd be here a lot longer if we did list everything. And next, we just have OMA out in the community. Some of the, these are pictures of some of the events that we did attend, where we gave citations, where we held seminars, working with our MWBEs, and additional outreach of events that we went to regarding the uh, including the mental health forum and also our Gene Teen celebrations. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. Uh, Bishop Harvey, uh, Dr. Williams, did you have any statement to make? Uh, certainly, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, press on. I certainly want to thank this esteemed legislators uh, for having us here today and for your great leadership uh, I just want to commend uh, the great leadership that Lionel Chitty is providing to this office. Uh, he has taken the bull by the horn, so to speak, and we have been following his lead as a great team that has been engineered, that is actually out here doing the work. Uh, there's so many different components to this, and we have been arduously taking it step by step. And I think you can see by the comprehensive report that has been displayed today, that we're keeping in line with the vision of the Charter. We're on our way to doing some very great things. We're making some systemic change right off to the top. And we're excited about uh, what we're able to do and what we've been able to accomplish thus far. We're automating some things that uh, should have been done a long time ago, uh, but there's no reason to make excuses. We're moving forward, and we're doing it uh, with a mindset that there's so much work out here to be done. Uh, just the very fact that we've gone through some devastating times and we've all been confronted with things that we never thought we would be confronted with. But through all of that, we continued to keep grinding and continue to keep doing the things that were necessary to make sure that our constituents and our stakeholders got the necessary information so that they could endure this pandemic that we're going through. Also, when we're talking about what happened with George Floyd and the things that are happening with the racial disparities, uh, we've been engaging extensively with Commissioner Ryder and the police department in terms of moving forward. Uh, the county executive has been giving us great leadership, and we thank all who have been partnering with us to make sure that this county becomes the county that we can all be proud of. Uh, Evelyn Simmons has been wonderful 
as a deputy county executive who has been leading uh, to to solicit uh, MWBE participation. But some of the challenges are obviously that we have to go with a, the lowest qualified bidder. Correct. Right. Um, what assistance does your office provide to the MWBEs to try and educate them uh, as to how to prepare a bid, as to um, make sure that they're competitive in that bid process? We, in the past, we did have seminars, uh, including uh, Robert Cleary, uh, Chief Procurement Officer, to explain this process. Again, it is daunting. I've done work with the county many, many, many years ago, and if you're doing a bid pro uh, package, you get a package of like 40, 50 sheets of paper. And you're like, wow, this is a lot, I can't do this. But once you go through it, the majority of the uh, information is there is documentation that's necessary just to do business. Disclaimer forms, EEO information, all that stuff, all, all, all that pertinent information. So we tried to educate people exactly what the entire process is to continue to look into the system, make sure you're registered to do business with need, and just to start building that relationship. Okay. Now, I, I didn't mean to turn this into kind of a budget hearing. It almost sounds like that with me asking staffing questions and, and, uh, and the like. But, you know, in terms of um, do you feel as though your office at, at its current staffing um, has enough people to be able to fulfill its, its mandates? Again, we can work with the other outreach offices to try to get up to snuff as much as possible. But, again, some of these specific items, specifically some of the contract compliance, it's a full-time job. It literally is a full-time job. You've got thousands of contracts. I mean, Regina's done a very good job in the past and continues to do so. We work together as a team to make sure that we can understand what's going on, but it's a lot. And has there been any progress in attempting, and, and Legislative Slodges was quite correct in the, in the previous hearing mentioning the need for counsel. Um, has there been any progress in, in attempting to retain counsel? Uh, when I initially came in, I didn't feel that it was exactly necessary, but that's turned a little bit. Um, I would have to speak with, uh, we'd have to get more in depth with exactly what is required. I mean, I can read a contract, but I'm not an attorney, and I'm not going to pretend to say that I am. Uh, but some of us have worked with law in the past, and it's, it, again, it goes back to that full understanding of the contracting process, and we're not 100% there yet. Okay. And, and obviously, you know, since part of the, the mandate, obviously, is, is the contracting and procurement process and, and ensuring minority participation, obviously that would be a problem not to have someone who is an expert in assisting you in doing that, it would be right? it would be it would be a challenge. So now, uh, if you were to if you were to have the ability to hire the additional five full time staff and and two I guess intern positions that uh, that you would have, what would they do? Um, in, other, in other words, what could your department do better if you had the if you had the full staff that you were budgeted for? Uh, we would definitely focus on the contract portion. Uh, we would also beef up our outreach initiatives. Uh, we do have program coordinators right right now. We have two on staff. Uh, one does communication. The other one is Michelle Parsley, uh, who focuses on our um, certification process. Dexter Hedgepath focuses a lot on the communications, the social media, and some outreach portions. But uh, we definitely need to increase our outreach efforts. Uh, being there on site, talking to people one on one, being able to have them gain that specific trust to call into the office to be able to educate them, walk them through their specific processes, whether it's MWBE or any social issues, and also to try to be that resource for them. So we would expand upon that. We would also work, uh, have some, if we had increases, to be able to wrap our hands around some of the larger departments. Health and Human Services is massive, try, and uh, we have had conversations with them to talk about their different services, and we want to be that resource so that when people reach out to us, we can put them in the right direction. Uh, we've also want to be able to focus on civil service, workforce development. We've had uh, forums with civil service to walk constituents exactly through that entire process. We get them in a room, sit them down with the computers, and civil service shows them exactly how to apply for civil service, how to keep on top of the notifications. So we would be able to increase our efforts on all those specific factors and look for other opportunities to be able to help our constituents. Okay. I mean, the Charter does specifically mention social services, mental health, health mm -hmm. services, public works, public safety. Uh, that, that's, is, that, is that something that's happening now, at, at, or, or could it simply be happening better if you had additional people? It could be happening better. We are, we, our team is, 
has specific tasks. For example, Victoria Roberts, she brings a lot of skills to the table to talk about recidivism, to talk about mental health initiatives. So we put them in touch, we have been in touch with the Department of Social Services. We work collaboratively with them. We've been in touch with NASA Community College and other um, organizations throughout NASA County and even Suffolk County, which is the beauty of Zoom, working with uh, the Entrepreneurial Assistance Center and at Suffolk County's Brentwood campus, the Small Business Development Center at Farmingdale State College, Hospice Ascent Program, and even organizations within the city that focus specifically on MWBEs to be able to reach out to them, connect with them, even LaFuerza for funding opportunities, and also to be able to talk about this is technical assistance to help our people. Uh, we have Dexter Hespes who also speaks directly with our community members. We just, we'd basically be able to touch more upon those specific items in the charter and do it a lot better. Okay. Just in terms of, and I know that you've had, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up because I know you, get, I know you have questions. Um, it, it seems as though obviously the the vendor registration portal uh, that you've created uh, certainly has resulted in in uh, a large number of certifications. Certainly more than we had a year ago uh, by a significant percentage, and and that's wonderful. Uh, but I know it's it's probably still only a fraction of the MWBE that actually exists. What what are our outreach efforts in terms of identifying MWBE um, and and getting them to participate in the certification process? Right now, we cannot go out to solicit those individuals. As we go to events, even as we do Zooms, people have those specific questions. And they do come into call into us or email us with, with questions. That's why we do things like the Hempstead Chamber of Commerce I just did last week, the Uniondale Community Council. People know of what MWB is, but they're not even sure about what's it going to do for them. So we're honest with them and say, listen, Massa County contracting, we have no firm goals. But then we start talking about the, uh, the uh, diversity study. We talked to them that about uh, there is no fee to sign up and that you would take the time to take the process to go look into the system and see if there is something that you could bid on. As far as any other additional outreach, not at this moment right now. We do the best that we can with what we have dur during the current situation with COVID. But when we are able to go back out, we do have those conversations on small, with small groups, existing organizations that are out there. Not uh, basically knocking on doors and telling people, hey, listen, you need to come in and get certified with Nassau County and start bidding on some of these items, if that answers your question. What ways could outreach be improved? We talked in terms of, and we've already started collaborating with the different chambers of commerce, as well as um, one of the larger um, organizations, Long Island Business News, has a list of MWBEs, I want to say in the thousands, somewhere close to 10,000. So we've been in contact with them to try to ascertain their list um, so that we can reach out to those NWBs as well. Connecting with the other municipalities is something that we do on a regular basis to try to you know, stretch our hands a little further and reach the NWBs that aren't already registered in the vendor portal. So those are some of the things that we've already started do, doing, as well as building different committees so that uh, different primes um, that are out there, NWBE primes, and as well as some of the SDVOB primes, you know, that we can, they can aid us in being able to go stretch our hands a little further and reach out to those smaller businesses. Outside of going door to door, uh, those are the things we try to do, look at all the different processes and businesses that already have lists out there and, uh, and collaborate with them to try to get that information. Okay. And, and I, last, last thing, <laughs> famous last words. Last, I know that, um, that Legislative Lodge is going to ask about Title VI, and, and I'm assuming uh, the HUD Section 3. Just out of curiosity, obviously part of the Office of Minority Affairs is, is making sure that we're implementing uh, the county's own affirmative action program. Do we know presently how many women and minorities we have employed within Nassau County? I do not have that information. I can reach out to see if I can attain that. But um, if that, I'm sorry, we do not have that information. I can reach back out, speak with human resources or, or whatever uh, the, the administration to ascertain that information for you and get back to you. Is that, I mean, since the department is supposed to be tracking, uh, obviously, our affirmative action program, isn't that something that, that should be reported to you on a regular basis in terms of hiring? I feel that we, we, that should be. What we have done is, again, looking at affirmative action is to have um, uh, collaborative uh, meetings with the, um, 
sorry, collaborative events with the other two outreach offices, again with civil service, to bring more awareness to constituents as to where do you apply, how do you apply, and how does that system work. I think that's a good opportunity to try to get more people interested in these civil service positions that are eventually will spread out either into the county, into the libraries, into the school districts, and all the other uh, different departments that fall within civil services realm. Well, doesn't each individual department have its own affirmative action plan in terms of hiring? I not 100% sure. I do know that the uh, corrections facility does, but um, I can take a look and get back to you with that information. I, I appreciate that. I'm going to turn over the questioning at this time, though I have more follow-up later. Um, yeah. We can't do that because of civil service, but with ordinance jobs, right. is there a plan that we could address that would promote increased more minority, minority and women in, the, in, in various county departments? I guess I have. It, it sounds like we can. Yeah. Okay, great. But if I could piggyback off of that question. Sure. Thank you. Do you have any information as to how many minorities are in the police department? Uh, no, I do not. Do you have any information as to how many minorities are in the Legal Aid Society? Uh, no, I do not, but I can reach out to see if I can ascertain that information and report In that. previous years at budget hearings, when Mr. Ed Scott Banks, who heads the Legal Aid Society, uh, stood here, sat here in the same chair that you're sitting in, I asked him if there were any black or brown female attorneys or male attorneys in the Legal Aid Society, and he testified that there were not any. And that could be very concerning that there are no uh, minority attorneys in the Legal Aid Society. Um, so I've also been talking to various county employees and there is a belief that there is overabundance of minorities in the parks department. Is that correct? I would have to take a look to see if I can ascertain those specific numbers for you, but I do not know right now. Are you aware of any plan by the administration to increase the you know, participation of minorities in county government? I knew that, do know that the administration has been working directly with us again to go through that civil service process to bring more awareness to uh, uh, communities of color as to the process of uh, looking, uh, signing up for civil service, going through the entire process, taking the testing, and uh, keeping an eye on any opportunities that do become available. So is it ba based on your analysis, is it the case that minorities are not applying, or is it the case that, that we need to do a better job of looking for more qualified applicants? Having a real conversation with civil service and the administration, what I've ascertained is that a civil service, if you take a test, you're not going to get a call back the next day. It's going to take a while. You know, you have specific lists and rules and regulations, and even in my past experience, civil service takes a long time. You know, they are, have to abide by the rules and regulations of the state. So you might have somebody that takes a test today, and they might not get an opportunity to actually get a call back a year, a year or more from now. At that point, somebody's life changed. You know, if they really needed a job, maybe they took something else, maybe they found a better opportunity, and that civil service position was no longer um, attractive for them. That's what I've been able to ascertain. But if it was a priority for administration, they could accomplish these goals. Um, it would still be a challenge, and that's why we've worked with civil service to bring more awareness to minorities and uh, to minorities and communities of color to start that process to make sure that they understand it. Because when we started holding our forums, I think we had about five or six forums. Each one of them was packed. But isn't the county saying that like they do not tolerate racism and discrimination? But is there any actual plan of oversight and accountability that can help check or identify or, ramp or, or control the rampant racism that's going on? Um, again, it goes back to that initial conversation as looking at looking back at our civil service processes and again reaching out to people, have them participate. But there's no education. plan by the county to address that. Not that I'm aware of. There, there could be. I'm, I'm not aware of that. Okay. And is someone here from the administration that could speak on behalf of the uh, IG's office? I mean, is the IG's office is the attorney is the IG's office getting all these contracts and why aren't they forwarding them to the OMA Office of Minority Affairs? Is someone here from the administration? Can't just the IG's office just forward the contracts to OMA? Katie Horst from the administration. It's my understanding that the IG has the ability to see every contract. Whether she, whether she reviews it or not is up to her. And is the IG's office forwarding these contracts to the Office of Minority Affairs? The IG is an office of, is an, office of an arm of your office, so I would ask you to speak with her. Thank you. Furthermore, uh, you meant, well, the county charter states in section 211, 2111 
uh, the Office of Minority Affairs shall have the following powers and duties. And under section and part F, as in Frank, it says, provide assistance in the implementation of affirmative action programs in county government employment, housing, and development of an annual, uh, annual affirmative action report required by the county for certain of its state and federal sources. Has the county accomplished this report? Yes. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Again, we, when we have these discussions, when we talk about workforce, we go through that process of educating people on how to apply for civil service. So the county is not fulfilling its mission in producing this affirmative action report? I am not aware of an affirmative action report that has been prepared. I can reach out and try to ascertain that information for you. It's very concerning. You. And now, furthermore, the county also says in Section E, as in Edgar, produce and publish any research papers or studies on issues affecting the minority community. Has the Office of Minority Affairs helped to accomplish this past goal, this goal? Right now, the closest we can come to is the, high, uh, the awarding of the disparity study so we can have a comprehensive look as far as the uh, utilization and availability of MWVEs and SDVOBs. Uh, we should be very close to uh, awarding that contract very soon, and then we can begin that process of trying to uh, flush out those numbers to make sure that we can have full utilization of those that are available. Okay. Yeah, I mean, going back to the IG's office, like, I mean, we just need to find out how the Office of Modern Affairs is granted further access, and we need to you know, push that more. Um, but going back to this issue, my question now pertains to hiring. I mean, this is important because we had this last hearing on April 23rd, 2019, and that was for the administration. The administration was in power for at least 16 months. And now, on this date, the administration has been in office for over 32 months, almost three years. And it's concerning that we just don't see, and you could say that corona or COVID affected this, but it's just concerning that after 32 months, we don't have a plan, an actual plan. And as they say, if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail. Do we have any plan to help promote diversity I mean, I'm looking at the controller's report uh, that he issued last year, even before Black Lives Matter was a popular slogan. And he talked about in that report that we're just 10 years away from the minority in Nassau County to be the majority. Just 10 years away. But if that's the case, then why are these, all, all these important government agencies in the county, such as the police department, lacking real diversity? We had a, a community forum with the police department uh, and I want to thank Nassau County Police Department for their great work. But we had a forum with them, with the community, right after George Floyd's death. And one of the you know, heads of the police department mentioned you know, the numbers of black and brown faces in the police department. And, the no and my apologies, I don't have the numbers before me now, but the numbers were very low. So I just find it concerning and not, you know, it doesn't make sense to me that we're just 10 years away from minorities being the majority in Nassau County, but these government departments don't reflect that diversity. And that is a clear red flag for institutional racism. I'm not calling anybody racist here, not at all. No one's perfect, not at all. But we have to step forward and try to do better here. And so this office has a very important purpose and it needs an attorney, but how can we hire an attorney now with a, with a hiring freeze? How are we gonna get around that? Can someone from the administration talk about that? I mean, if we could at least establish if there's a need for an attorney in this office. I mean, the fact that there's no attorney, what type of, uh, think it's vulnerable for litigation, the fact that we're not helping to, you know, establish or achieve these important laws, does that make it vulnerable for, for litigation? I couldn't answer that question, sir. Who can answer that question? You'd have to defer that to the administration. Again, as we've uh, worked diligently to wrap our hands around all the different items that the Office of Minority Affairs is tasked with, um, my whole process is that we take things in bits and pieces. We take one item, get a process in place, make sure it's functional, make sure it's sustainable, and that it can move forward and be efficient. So as we take different pieces on, it will be a continuous process for us to make sure that we can get to meeting all the needs of the charter. Can someone from the county attorney's office come and talk about maybe the, the number of lawsuits that we've had to settle out due to claims of discrimination and, you know, racism? I mean, you know, we're spending a lot of money with these, with these you know, with litigation, these lawsuits, these settlements, but we could do some pretty 
simple steps to address these issues. So is anyone here from the county attorney's office that could talk about that? The average payout in settlements based on claims of racism? Anybody here? I will Katie Horse from the administration, sorry. Um, no one's here from the county attorney's office, just Director Chitty was uh, invited today to present. Is it possible that you can call someone from the county attorney's office to come down here and speak on that? I can try. Thank you. Uh, uh, I continue, the disparity study, uh, MWBE participation goals. We have a very, we have an oversized super stadium in Elmont being built as we speak. Are we fulfilling our goals of minority women business participation in that big billion dollar project? That billion dollar project is still being worked on. We have had forums with the uh, MWBEs to educate them on the processes. Uh, also, we've also had forums with the Belmont where we had a packed room working uh, directly with ESD to educate uh, the businesses on how to apply. We've connected them with the contractors. The challenge with that is as we look at federal and state funding, they need to be certified with that, um, that uh, authority, specifically New York State. If I walked in right now to certify with New York State, it's at least two, at least two years of a process now. The only way to get past that is if the, um, from what I understand is that if a MWBE who is not certified and the prime contractor wants that specific MWBE to participate, we might have the opportunity to expedite it. But again, it is a process. We need to make sure that, that, that uh, MWBE's paperwork is all in order and then we contact the state and it's their final decision. Again, it's depending on where the funding is, that's but what we have, have on professional opinion, sir, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but is, are, are, are minority communities receiving their fair share of the pie when it comes to these billion dollar projects all across Nassau County? Um, I couldn't specifically attest to that. I would say no, but I'll give you one example for the Bay, Tra Bay Park sewage plant out of $719 million being allocated. I'm sorry, uh, MWB, I'm sorry, $719 million. 93.5 of, 93 million of that was allocated to MWBEs. They have already been paid. As far as SDVOBs, 1.4%, so that's two out of $296 million. Uh, veteran contract value was $4,159,000. So there are some successes. They're not as great as some expectations might be, but uh, this specific department, these specific um, uh, projects have been engaging in order to try to accomplish and meet their numbers overall. Understood. Thank you. Um, furthermore, and I appreciate everything you've been doing, I truly do, but are there any other roles or duties of this office that, in all candor, are not being met by your office? We're doing the best of, charter mission? as far as the overall charter, we do have some areas that need more attention, but again, overseeing the office, I need to make sure that no matter what happens, each process is taken bit by bit. We need to find out what the process is, adapt it, put in specific processes to make sure they are efficient and sustainable in order to move forward. Because as we've seen over years, as things change, things fall through the holes. And being 2020, there's no reason why we should not have specific automation like the MWB app and other systems that are out there to expedite us knowing what's going on and being able to meet the needs of our MWBEs. And that's my specific goal. Thank you. I'd just like to report that the IG has advised that the Office of Minority Affairs can arrange with the procurement director, Robert Clearly, to receive information. Okay. okay. Just receive that message. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, furthermore, uh, I, I really need a deadline, please, from your office and from the administration as to numbers of minorities all throughout uh, the county government. There is an oversaturation of blacks in the, in the parks department, and I don't know why that's the case. And we need to, you know, hopefully understand why that's the case, and, and furthermore, see how we could help promote diversity in other very important county departments. Uh, furthermore, um, I have some more questions, but I really, you know, in the interest of time, and I really want to hear from, from some of my colleagues, uh, please, I, I rest the rest of my time. I reserve the opportunity to speak again. <laughs> Thank you, Legislative Select. Uh, Legislative Relay. Thank you, Chairman Rhodes. Um, I, first, I want to thank you for this presentation. It's, it's 
it's really great to see that there's been so much progress made um, in, in getting the office up and running. And um, I know that there have been significant challenges. And, uh, and now with COVID, of course, that, that just compounds the challenges. Um, but I did have some specific questions. Um, you mentioned about the, um, with the and taking from the question from uh, Legislator Solage with the Belmont uh, project that there had to be, that they had to be registered also with the state and federal government, is that correct? Correct. Their MWBE, right. So is there any way that we as a county can work alongside with the, the federal and state uh, MWBE department so that we're asking the same questions and that if they uh, are registered for one, they could be registered for another? Right. What, what, we, what, we, what we try to do is, and I just got this question from last week, uh, which I've answered numerous times from the Hempstead Chamber of Commerce. A uh, young lady asked me, should I register with the county or yeah. with some other agency? My explanation to them is, the majority of the paperwork is similar for each certification, whether it's New York State, New York City, New York, New Jersey Port Authority, New York State Dorm Authority, it, it's pretty much the same. So if you're gonna do one, do every single one of them at the same time while you have the information in front of you. The challenge again is people are not understand, don't fully understand what's the benefit from it. Over, my, over the course of my career, I've seen people who get certified and they haven't had real opportunity. A lot of that comes down with education. Again, the bid package, it becomes cumbersome. Are you making the right connections? We also get um, prime contractors who reach out to us and say, I can't find enough MWBEs. We go into the state system, and then we see that some contact information was there, was, uh, was uh, erroneous or missing. So again, it's a full process to be able to shine a big spotlight on these huge opportunities. We do have some success stories. Can we do more? Yes, we can. But we're doing our part to make sure that we can increase that. Uh, Dr. Williams, you wanted to add something? Uh, yes. Um, on last year, Chitty and I, we did go to Manhattan and we met with Empire State Development. Um, we began the conversation of possibly our office having someone um, to as a satellite for uh, Empire State Development so that when they certify with us that we will already have someone on staff to handle state certification so that we can better serve our constituents. That conversation already started, and I believe we received the MOU, was it? Uh, yes, we did receive a, um, an MOU. The state was looking for additional outlets or offices where people could go more locally to get certified because their process takes extremely long right now. So we have that MOU. COVID hit, but we do have it, and we can share that with the administration to see if it's an opportunity to increase that opportunity for MWBEs. Right. In that conversation, um, the, the state thought it was a great idea for us to have someone uh, within our department to be able to handle state certification, um, and they also had shared, um, because of the backlog they have, we would be handling all of the Nassau County um, constituents that want to be state certified and that it would really aid them a great deal. So it is something, the conversation already began. We spoke with administration about it, but we just haven't gotten to that point yet, but we did begin that conversation. So is that a position that would potentially be funded by the state? It would have to be. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so along those lines, you, you obviously have a lot of new applications according to your report. Correct. Um, first of all, how long does it take for, for someone to go from handing in their application to actually being certified? Well, again, that depends, and I'm going to defer to Dr. Williams because she manages that process. Right. Um, right now, um, because of the tutorial that we have that they can follow, if someone actually files their documents and after our certification analyst, Michelle Crossley, reviews them, and if everything is in proper order, where there's nothing for us to actually do or contact them, um, it can be done in Six hours. Six hours. Oh, okay. <laughs> and are you finding that that's actually happening? Very rare. W very okay. rare. We've, we've, <laughs> had, we've had two businesses that I will say within three weeks they filed, and three weeks later we were able to certify them since we started. Okay. So, and I say three weeks because of the fact that um, with COVID we already had paper filings that our certification analyst was going through, but in all actuality, when we timed it, it can be done just like that. 
okay. if they give us what we need, which is the, the biggest hurdle is our constituents giving us the documentation that's required. And we're not asking for anything more. It's less than what they would do for New York State, but once they give it to us, that's the issue, making sure that they give us exactly what we need. And okay. it, it is understandable, again, over the years as a consultant, I've had people who, they just don't have that quick access to all their, all their pertinent information. And it's, it's tough for some small businesses. They're focusing on making money, producing their product, taking care of their clients. Right. It becomes something tenuous like doing your taxes. Right, you that's always been the complaint that, it, that it's just too onerous to do for so little benefit, so little perceived benefit to, to, uh, to file. Perceived benefit, yes. correct. correct. Um, so given the large number of applications that you have, how will you be addressing that backlog well, right now we have uh, Michelle Crosley, who was our analyst. She focuses 100% on those, and uh, we're trying to cross-train as much as we can. It's going to take us some time. We did not expect uh, that we would have that many in the queue to get certified. It's a good thing, thank goodness we do have this process, but it's going to take time. And if we're looking at us versus New York State, and it takes them years, we're not in that. We're not in such an awkward position compared to any other municipalities. But we're going to do our best to get through it as quickly as we can. Okay, and then um, how many applications, you said stay tuned for more information, so I'm going to ask for a little bit more information. How many um, uh, applications did you receive? I'm not 100% sure I can answer that because of the, um, could anybody help me out as for, from the administration? Can I even talk about that since? Oh. I'm not 100% sure I can even talk about uh, how many, who, or anything like that as far as that process is concerned. All right, and do you know uh, the projected date of the award? I don't have an exact date. I'm hoping real soon, <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as we can solidify things. We're at the very last stage. Okay, We're at the so last are stage. you talking one week, one month, six I'm talk months? I, to be safe, I would say within the next 30 days. Hopefully within the next I 30 days. I understand, I'm not gonna hold you to that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and then how long will the study take to complete? It depends on uh, who the awardee is, what the contracting process is, negotiations, then how, what their process is of getting the information from us. Again, it's going to be two counties pulling information, historical information from both counties, uh, doing a lot of community outreach. I've seen numbers anywhere between nine months up to 14, depending. Again, we don't have an exact number for that. From research that we've done, every disparity study is a uh, process into itself, and you really can't compare that much to one to another. But again, it just depends, and it'll, it'll be the process. Okay. Uh, and our legal counsel has advised that there is no legal reason not to disclose how many. Oh, okay. How many applicants we have? Yeah. We had five, five people um, submitted or uh, responded to our RFP. Okay. By businesses. Thank you. I have many, many, many more questions, but I will uh, stop here and with the request that we, we have another committee meeting um, because there are just so many more topics to talk about, to talk about housing, to talk you know, disparities in housing, to talk about the disparities in health care, which you, you mentioned, um, to talk about police reform. It, we just have so many things that we, we need to talk about. Um, so, but I will yield back. Thank you. Legislator, Thank you. Rhodes, Legislator, Rhodes, Legislator Rhodes, if I could. Uh, yes. So a previous question, uh, we've been informed by Robert Cleary for our, our Chief Procurement Office that all of the uh, solicitations that do come into uh, to Office of Minority Affairs, they, all of them are coming in. And we are made aware of all the solicitations from all the departments. So I can confirm that. But you're not confident that every one of them is being reviewed, obviously, because you don't have the ability to do that, right? We, we do the best that we can. No, understood. I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're trying to do that, but... I'm not a million percent sure. I would like to say I am, but I, 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 can't, I can't say that I am. Okay. Uh, Legislator Walker. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much for your presentation. It was certainly very, very thorough, and um, I can honestly tell you I feel like you've accomplished more in a very short span of time compared to uh, what this committee had done for years. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. And uh, to see you working so hard together, you know, you said you really have become a family and, and uh, you know, taking calls in the middle of the night and uh, because you want to succeed and you want to see this this go very, very well. And I really think you're you're on the right path. So I want to thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, I do understand that we are in a hiring freeze, but uh, 
and I do understand finances are very difficult this you know right now they always are but especially after COVID and the amount of monies that's been spent and so on and so forth but uh, staffing is very very important for your department and to you to be more successful you really need to get be able to get those uh, that hiring done um, you know I, I would love to be able to see someone to be able to work on the contracts um, and what you've done with IT and enabled you to be able to uh, as as information comes in and you can notify the different businesses that that might pertain to is is wonderful because you can do that pretty much instantly but you really need the manpower to be able to do that and to be able to do it with all the contracts so um, I think that's something we'd all be pushing for to see happen uh, you know unfortunately that staffing is needed in many departments and uh, but this is very vital to yours uh, the other thing, um, and I know it's very difficult because we're still in, in uh, you know, limited access to each other with COVID, but, uh, you know, for some people, I mean, we find that even uh, with people trying to fill out forms for, for you know, with, with assessment or diff different things we have here at work, it's almost like impossible for them to do it on their own. And they almost need need someone there with them to help them. Some of them have very small businesses, so it's not like, you know, larger businesses have the capability of having someone fill out this paperwork for us, do this, um, gather up all the information. Um, but a small business, you know, you can't gather their information for you, but for some of them, you know, you hand them that packet of paper, it's, it's overwhelming. So before, before they even begin, it's like, I can't do this. You know, it's kind of been like homeschooling with the four grandchildren. In the beginning, when it was all on paper, before it was on the computer, my little seven-year-old, he'd look at that packet, and he was already falling off the chair because, oh, I can't do all that. You know, it, it's overwhelming, especially when you're not sure what to do. So I would hope at some point uh, you would have the staffing and the capabilities and people could come in and you could, you know, sit or go out to that business. Somebody could go out to that business and work with those individuals who really need that help you know, basically on a one-to-one -one basis, even to fill out the forms, because, you know, they, that that could be stopping them right then and there. You know, they don't get any further than that. So um, I'd love to see us be able to do to do that. Um, and again, you know, I don't want to go on and on, because I know James has questions also, but, uh, you know, please, we're here for you, and whatever we can help you with. And, and you know, I, for one, and I'm sure all of us will really be pushing for the staffing that you need to make this department work the way it should be. So thank you again for everything. Thank you very thank much, you. and it is a team effort. It's not just, it's all of us working together because we do have a mission to, to move forward. But again, we are working with our other offices to try to share some of the, a little bit of that load. But again, everything's a process. Thank you, Legislator Walker. Uh, Minority Leader Abrams, I understand there's a question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Bro. I hope, thank you for accommodating us that are able to do this remotely as well. So my, my, my question uh, to the Office of Minority Affairs is more tied into what we're seeing throughout our country and our county in regards to some of the social action that pertains to uh, police reforms. Uh, and obviously uh, my question to Mr. Chitty as well as to the entire uh, group, uh, Mr. Harvey as well as Dr. Williams, is that th there are there have been three bills um, that are up for, I'm sorry, two bills that have been up for discussion, as well as more uh, conceptual um, uh, reforms that have been put into place. Do you envision the Office of Minority Affairs opining on the plate hotline or body cameras or the mental health study and the mental health unit in the police department study. Um, we, I think your, your, your opinion as well as your, your ability to understand what is going on throughout, not just the minority communities, but from what we've seen from the protesters, it's, it's coming from all communities. I think it's important that, that your office demonstrates some level of a position on those particular issues. And I just wanted to know what's your level 
of comfort as well as your ability to be able to do that. Um, I, thank you very much, uh, uh, Legislator Abrams. Um, we are engaged in these conversations, whether it's myself or my staff, especially uh, Victoria Roberts, who participates in the police and community trust meetings. We've had a couple of those as we move forward into those mental health issues and discussions. Uh, we are definitely involved in all of those. Uh, we do know that it is needed, and we, we know that the uh, current administration is actively engaging uh, individuals, organizations, all stakeholders in order to have that initial conversation to come with the same plans but the office of minority affairs is 100 percent engaged and will continue to be engaged whether somebody calls and having questions with those we have received calls issues concerning specific things especially with the police department we forward those over we track them but again i do know that uh, the current administration is definitely engaged and the office of minority affairs will continue to stay engaged with all stakeholders regarding such issues uh, oh, minority leader, can, I just, Chitty, I, can oh, I just uh, as you're all, can I just, oh, sorry, can I just add I'm some sorry. things to it? I'm so, I'm sorry, uh, because as the uh, deputy uh, director for diversity and community engagement, I've been actively involved on 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 many different levels, uh, uh, speaking concerning many of these different issues. Uh, actually, with our, our police commissioner, uh, with the communities, uh, for various stakeholders that have been involved even uh, when they were trying to implement some of the laws uh, that, that uh, uh, say my name. Uh, so all of these things we have been actively engaged in on a continual basis. That's one of the efforts that we engineer in, our, uh, uh, in minority affairs. And uh, we, we keep uh, the people informed. Uh, we have our finger in the, on the pulse uh, when we're dealing with uh, these issues that are so very important and inform all of our communities. Uh, one thing that we're learning is that it has an impact not just on minority communities, but on everybody. And uh, we have to really uh, have intelligent conversation, uh, but we've also uh, taken steps to make sure that some of these laws will be implemented. I think already uh, the, uh, the, the camera law has already been in place. Uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, body cams on, on, on some individuals, I, I would imagine, um, when we talked about that. And that's something I think that we agree that we should have. It was just a financial thing. Uh, so uh, when we look at these things going forward, all of them are going to make for a better police department, all are going to make for a better county. Uh, all the things that we need to do uh, will make for a better community. And that's what it's really all about. Okay. Uh, Bishop, I, I apologize. Uh, my apologies, Bishop. I'm probably going to go to, go to confession after this, but to my understanding, Bishop, there are no body cameras, only on Freeport officers. Right. Uh, and you saw what you saw what that led to. Nothing. But anyway, um, uh, there are, there are no body cameras on Nassau County police officers. Just to be correct here. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. They are, the Freeport does have them. And we've been fighting but, for that since 2014. And I know we've been fighting for them, but I, from what I would understand. I thought that you know that's something that they're working towards, all right. So I think I think that in the conversations that I've had, and and I've been pretty engaged at the table on some of these things. Uh, uh, so the, the, the general feel. No, 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 no. The, the general. No, there are no body cameras now. But the general feel uh, is that it's something that they, they should be looking into, and it's something that that should be done. And and the law has been passed. Actually, that by didn't didn't the law pass on the state level? That, that they are, yes, they are going to be body them, cams. Yes. Okay, okay, so it's been passed on the state level that there should be body cams, and that's something that's being discussed. All right. I, I, I guess right, am I right? Am I correct? George, that only pertains to state uh, <laughs> troopers and state <laughs> officers, not I, county officers. Sorry, Kavan. I apologize. Whenever you're ready. No, you are ready. Sorry, Kavan. Oh, so I, 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 I just want, I don't think I heard an answer to the question, so I just want to make sure that it's clear. Is the, is the Office of Minority Affairs, do they plan to present a position very similar to the impact studies that they did many years ago in regards to the position of, of, of a particular bill or a particular economic item on how it pertains to the minority community? Do they plan to state a position on, on the various bills that have been drafted and presented it to the clerk's office. Do you plan to present a position on the impact of those bills on the minority community, such as the complaint hotline, such as the mental health 
uh, study unit and body cameras or whatever other police initiatives or police reforms in a whole? Does the, does, does the office plan to present some level of, of an opinion on where they stand on these things? Uh, to answer that question, when you say an opinion, or are you looking towards research that could back that opinion up? I would not feel comfortable with the Office of Minority Affairs giving, quote unquote, an opinion. Um, we are here or to. A position. Oh, so, position. Or, or, I'm sorry, a, a, a position on that. We are the Office of Minority Affairs. We are here as a resource for basically all constituents. As far as the position, we want our, to do our best to abide by the rules and regulations set forth for us by law. As far as positions, I leave that up to the administration. We know what we need to do for these community, well, for all constituents, and we're going to do what we need to do in order to make sure that people feel comfortable, whether it's with the police reaching out to us with for information and directing them along the right way. I'm not, I don't think that answers your question, but that would be my response. Well, I mean, if I understand the answer to your response, and I'm looking, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, it sounds like you're not going to be able to provide a position, which is your opinion, uh, as well as your, 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 your position, which is fine. But it sounds like the office will not provide a position as it pertains to legislation that impacts minority communities, if I'm understanding you correctly. Um, a position, no. What we can do is we can, take a, we can take a step back, look at some research and some data, and provide that to you at a later date. And uh, I think that would be appropriate okay i think mr chitty i think you should go back and take a look uh and possibly revise your position uh i think people need people look to the office of minority affairs as it pertains to your leadership mm -hmm. and i think they would want to hear from the office of minority affairs on bills that very well could impact their lives so i'll i'll, I'll agree to disagree uh, but i think you should take a strong look at your position going forward because your office is seen as the the leadership office of minority issues. I mean, I would present the same question as it pertains to uh, uh, any of the other minority offices, whether it's Asian Affairs or anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's important that, that those, the leadership in those offices do present a position as it pertains to items that impact minority communities. No different than if it was economic issues or contractual issues. The very same issue that you had specified earlier, trying to get that data uh, as well. So, I, or those contracts as well. Thank okay. You. I appreciate the, that. Uh, I will get back to you, but and I will also rely on the administration. But again, we will do our best to make sure that we can fulfill all of them. Did he already leave? No, he's, no, he's in the course. Uh, I'm sorry, you still there, Leg uh, Legislator Evans? There he is. Yeah, you still there. I'm here. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, I will de definitely speak with the administration regarding the, that specific point of a position. But again, uh, we will do the best that we can to meet the needs of all the minorities, but I will get back to you uh, regarding that specific question. I thank you. Yeah, Very much appreciated. We would also, uh, Mr. Chitty, and, and I know we've, we've spoken about PACT uh, quite a bit uh, today. Um, as you know, you attended the meeting as, as uh, Bishop uh, Harvey um, had a meeting back in the beginning of June uh, with the police department, uh, with yourselves and with, uh, with members of the community. Uh, try and begin a discussion. Um, we've kind of taken a step back because the following week, PAC started, and um, you know, my view was that we shouldn't have two competing uh, discussions going on at the same time. Uh, as, as myself as chair, and I'm sure the other members of the committee, the other members of the legislature, would want there to be some sort of update as to what progress PAC has been making, what the discussions are. I sent a letter to the county executive's office uh, asking for a, a list of people that, that were actually part of PAC, um, because we want to make sure that when we talk about having community stakeholders, we want to make sure that we have a, a, a fair cross-section of all community stakeholders so that we're, we're soliciting all opinions in that. Uh, and, and also a, a, you know, some sort of timetable for, uh, for what suggestions and, and reforms uh, the PACT is going to come up with. I haven't received that yet, but if you could just get word back to the administration, we would definitely be interested in, in seeing that uh, sooner rather than later. I would appreciate it. I know that we have... Are there any other questions from legislators? Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, it was excellent, to be quite honest with you. And I do uh, also want to echo the, the sentiments of many of the legislators up here in regard to uh, the need for you to get um, you know, more employees. If you have been budgeted for 12, 
and currently you're at seven, um, just listening to all the initiatives and all the projects and all the different um, areas of everybody's lives that you have to go into, whether or not it's with, you know, we, we spent a lot of time on contracts, when you look at housing, when you look at the issue of health, when uh, police reform, uh, I mean, I, I could go on and on, and I think even so, I'm sure that you do get involved with the educational aspect to make sure that our students are prepared. You know, as you said, that even with civil service tests, you know, you want to make sure that uh, many of our young people, especially minority communities, are aware that they could take these tests, that it can provide them a good job with good benefits, um, and, um, you know, that. You know, it's something that they have to be a little bit patient, and I, I know what you mean, because there are people who've waited like seven years after they took a test. They got a call to, um, you know, come for that job and stuff like that. So, you know, perhaps maybe uh, we can work with civil service so that maybe perhaps it could be a faster turnaround time for many of these positions. Um, I think that the cl current climate today, and we see everything that is going on, has just enhanced the importance of your office. And I think that uh, despite the fact that there is a freeze, a hiring freeze, I think in this case, an exception must be made by this administration to allow you to bring counsel in and to, bring you, to allow you to bring in the necessary people that you would have, need in order to fulfill your duties and your obligations to our community. And uh, I urge the administration to heed all of us because I think we're all in agreement that uh, at this point, now is the time. You have a lot on your plate, okay? You're doing an excellent job right now, and I, I agree with Rose. We've seen a lot more out of this committee, uh, this department, than we had in many, many years. And uh, I want you to keep going full steam ahead, because I think that next year, I want us to have a bit of a, a better tone in saying, so that we have all the, the initiatives that many of us are looking for, and that we see more and more uh, minorities coming into um, into the county work and, and to be able to get the contracts that they need. Um, my other, just one little question. You know, I know that when we look at uh, these businesses and you're helping them get the contracts, unfortunately, you know, I find um, that many, some of our small businesses are going under. And, um, you know, and I think it's in the governor's reluctance, you know, to allow certain small businesses to reopen, like gyms, spas yoga studios, and it is my, in my experience that many of these businesses are owned by women. Is there anything that you could do or maybe advocate uh, on behalf of them? I don't know if this goes beyond your purview in trying to help us uh, try to keep these businesses open because nothing's sadder than finally getting these people to invest, to make a go of it, and then all of a sudden have the rug pulled right from, it, from under their feet. So. I, I would ask you that if that's the case, that maybe you can add your voice in, in trying to get maybe some help for these people and allow them to reopen. But Absolutely. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions or comments from legislators? Legislator Kennedy. Thank you, Legislator Rhodes. Um, I, I just want to say uh, I'm just impressed and I'm so thankful for everything that you've done. Um, Executive uh, Director Chitty, Dr. Williams, and uh, Bishop Harvey, and whole staff but like was said before um, it's obvious that you need more help and five more people would make tremendous tremendous difference as far as contracts um, outreach that could make um, make a tremendous difference um, and ease your workload and get you guys you, you all that are in a different position maybe that could be working toward different things and could like give off some of the load that you are carrying so that maybe you could do, be doing other things that that you know it would be um, better for your um, your focus, and I think that um, I like was said before. We really have to make sure that um, the hiring in this specific case five people, um, and it was budgeted, so it's it's five people that would make a tremendous difference. And I would just want to say um, I I along with everybody else pushing for that, and I want to thank both all of you for everything you've done. It's obvious to see that. Um, you've, <laughs> You've done a lot of work here and uh, made some great progress. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, Legislator Kennedy. Uh, I know that uh, there are many other questions uh, that legislators have, and we will endeavor to set up a, uh, another hearing. Uh, we will invite you back. Um, obviously, um, there was some information that you didn't have today. 
um, if we can endeavor to get that information specifically with respect to uh, Counties Affirmative Action Program and, and a variety of other topics which uh, we'll exchange by letter. Uh, if you can have that information when we, when we come back, that would be helpful as well and we can, uh, we can finish up. Um, I don't have any, uh, two things. Housekeeping, um, we are told that we have to vacate the chamber at noon, which we're at now. Uh, however, um, I know that I don't have any speaker forms, but I know that we have some members of the public that are here. Uh, I don't know if any intended to speak today. Mr. Guilty. All right. So, I, if, if we only have one, if we only have one speaker, mm -hmm. uh, on. we'll have Mr. Guilty Thank speak. You. And was there anyone else? Does anybody can submit comments in writing as well, which will be incorporated as part of the record? And obviously, we'll have more than sufficient time for uh, for public comment um, when we have our, our next hearing, uh, which I assure you will be soon. But in the meantime, Mr. Guilty, you may just state your name and, and address for the record. Andre Guilty, 1122 Van Buren Street, Uniondale, New York. I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Um, it came to our attention in um, November 2019 that the African American community was being robbed at a disproportionate amount of tax dollars for the money that they pay into the police department. And what we found, because I have a TV program called the African American News for 28 years, and I've been here many times, what we found was some of the most um, unbelievable um, accounts of police misconduct for people who pay taxes. Consequently, I was going to do an undercover operation and expose these rogue police officers in the first precinct. And I contacted our legislator, Kavon Abrams, and he said, don't go out there undercover and do that because the things that you're telling me are too outrageous for you to risk yourself at doing that. So we sent it through the line, and it made it, it sent it through the chain of command, and it made it to you in February. And what I would like to say is that um, we're not here today to talk about good cops. We're here to talk about the bad ones. I would love to speak to you in the language that they speak to the citizens, but I can't say those words because I've gone past that and I'm not doing a comedy routine today. But um, my notes here, I have a lot of buzzwords. Nassau County prides itself as being a sanctuary, but it's not a sanctuary for people who are victims of police terror and racial profiling under the, the guise of stop and frisk. Stop and frisk has been alive and well out here and it has been found unconstitutional in New York City but there's been nothing about it. And I've sent videotapes, we have testimonies of people who have been victimized by this behavior. And it's almost like the past laws in South Africa where police hide their ID, they hide their badges, and they demand your ID. And this is not happening in a bubble. This is not happening to people who are just in the wrong neighborhood. This is happening to the same targeted people on a daily basis, whether they're on a skateboard, bicycle, or car, or walking. They are constantly accosted by police who have a certain racial hatred for the people they are paid to protect and serve. So they came to me because of my program and because I'm not afraid to speak out on their behalf. So some of them were here today, but they had to leave. Uh, one of the, I'm going to say their names, uh, Archie Stallings, his mother's a nurse. She bought him a Mercedes-Benz BMW. He gets profiled weekly because he's not allowed to have that kind of a car. Arthur, let's see, Marcy Brando, she was stopping frisk, and that was almost like a strip search, so she was sexually harassed by officers. You had one officer holding someone's underwear up. He's been reprimanded for that. You have Casina Atkinson. She helped police find a dog. They cursed her out and, and threatened to beat her up after this. We have Sarah 
White House who was, the police said she sold them a kilo of cocaine and they gave her $60,000. She lost her business. She was found innocent. It never happened. But she spent $30,000. So we have uh, Ronald Spalling, who's profiled. We have a veteran, Charles Oliver, who was profiled. So we don't want to whitewash what's going on right now. People want justice, and a lot of them want vengeance. And, and what I can say to you today is that the people that I've seen, those people who started protesting after George Floyd, those weren't the church people. Those were the millennials. Those weren't people that you can give a job to and have come here and whitewash it. Those were people who don't believe in the Quran, the Torah, or the Bible. They're not forgiving. They don't turn the other cheek. You have a different generation. They want justice, and they want vengeance. Now, you could equate this to their behavior is a lot of innocent people over in Iraq. They were arrested, and they were taken to Abu Ghraib, and they were tortured, and they were a lot of them innocent, but they became radicalized by that behavior. And then you formed ISIS. So we see these types of similarities here, but people who lump people in as all blacks are to be police, you guys got to get your heads out of the sand because you are on a powder keg, whether you want to believe it or not, because people are not looking for support anymore. You, can, you see what's going on in the country, but we were here first back in January telling you that there's something going on here weird with the police. They're not policing. They're abusing their authority. They are operating with white supremacy that keeps white skin privilege, letting them know that they can kill people mistakenly without any accountability, with impunity. People are not going to tolerate that. People spend their lives investing in their children, growing them up. To have them taken away by a mistake and then no charges, these people are not going to be as forgiving as our grandparents were. So you guys are ahead of the curve, so to speak. We need to be able to take these police officers qualified immunity away. We need to take their pensions away. We need to lock them up. You also need to have the ability to test them randomly for steroids, alcohol, cocaine, and marijuana. Because I have videotape of 30 years that I've caught officers doing things that weren't something that I would destroy their careers for. But what's going on today, it has to end. You are representatives of the state. The police are a state body. Whatever they do, you're sanctioning it. You've got to give people another reason to believe in people, police again. People can't consciously tell their children, if you have a problem, call the police. So they can mistakenly kill somebody. And then when COVID came, now you're telling the people who are being victimized with trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder from watching black people continually get murdered on TV. And you want me to tell our children, call a cop? You guys are at a point of singularity. There's no turning back. This is all happening on your guard. You guys been here for years. I've been on TV for years. You all knew this day was coming. I have to speak for the people who are afraid to come to you and afraid of the police. Why are they afraid of the police? You've got to ask yourself these questions. The Office of Minority Affairs is a policing body for making sure the proper redistribution of our tax dollar. They have a policing body, which was their attorney, to go to the different divisions and make sure that we are being properly compensated for our tax dollar. We're not asking for no welfare. We are paying a disproportionate amount of tax dollars for bad service. And you guys know what's going on. We don't got to play semantics here. 
Because when I got to get out of my bed and leave my 11 month old year old baby because somebody's at a gas station getting gas and the police pull up to wait for them to give them a ticket again, this is a failed state. This is a failed state. Thank, thank you, Mr. Guilty. I'm just going to ask you to please wrap up, and there'll be an opportunity, obviously, up. for there'll be an opportunity for public comment as well at the at the full okay. legislative hearing. Okay. What you need to do is hold these people accountable, because all lives do matter. But nobody's killing police by mistake. Nobody's running up in their, their house killing their wife by mistake. Nobody's shooting an eight-year-old kid by mistake. Nobody's murdering police by mistake. So you guys have to act. There, there is a way going on. And I'm a harbinger of bad news. I don't have no good news to tell you. But it's going to get worse if you fail to act. Protect your citizens. These are American citizens. How the hell can you have a sanctuary city and you can't protect the citizens? Come on. This is the worst witnessing of taxation with no representation. That's what this Office of Minority Affairs was created for, because we were being robbed of contracts, robbed of our rights. So you guys have, have a position here, because there's nothing get a, to a point where there's nothing you're gonna be able to do to fix this. And I just want you to understand, and this is no disrespect to religion, people are not turning the other cheek anymore. They're not calling for the Lord. They're going to do something. They're going to do it themselves. They're not going to wait for you. Thank, thank you, Chief.